I'm going to ask you a question tonight. Do you like being followed? Do you like being followed? Social media has created a world where people post ideas, statements, pictures, recipes, philosophical ideas, and other things with the main intent to, to have a following. Honestly, I think that some of that that goes on is pretty narcissistic. That's a whole different discussion there. But, uh, you know, if we enjoy, if we do all this so that we can get a following, it's just really that we're trying to draw attention to ourselves. And, uh, you know, honestly, I, I, think, I think just something to be said about we need to reevaluate our, our objective in that. But, you know, there's some who enjoy, they want a following on social media. And then there's the majority of us who are very suspicious if we are being followed. Uh, you may have experienced in your life one time or another where there's that kind of following that you don't want, where we don't want strangers following us. We don't want other cars following us. In some cases, uh, we, we don't want the baggage from our past following us, if you know what I mean by that, past sins and past regrets following us. You know, there are things that happen in our life. I think as we can say as a whole, there are things we are very cautious about as far as people or things that follow us. However, if you look at Psalms 23, verse 6, David speaks about a following that is good, a following that every saved person has. That following he speaks about, it says this, Surely, that is without exception, with guarantee, with full assurance. He said, surely, goodness and mercy together. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In verse 6, he's summing up the blessing of everything that he wrote about in verses 1 to 5. He's summing up the blessing of being one of God's sheep. You might even say in verse 6 that he's saying it's wonderful to be a Christian. Amen? How many believe it's wonderful to be a Christian? Amen? It's wonderful. Listen, if you don't think it's wonderful to be a Christian, then, I, then number one, either, either you're not saved, or number two, you haven't been in God's Word for a long period of time. You, know, you don't just know what sweet fellowship is. And I hope that tonight, before we're done, that you understand how wonderful it is to be a Christian. You know, if, we're, if you weren't saved, man, you'd be in a terrible situation there. And David, David is saying here, he's saying, he's saying this, that, that, you know, surely God, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. David's saying it with great gladness. David's saying this with excitement. David's kind of pulling all the things together about this short psalm, about the psalm of the great shepherd here, about the Christian life, that what happens to us from the moment we get saved until the day the Lord takes us home or we graduate. Now, in order for us to understand what, what we're going to look at in verse 6, I want to do a summary leading to that. And we saw in verse 1, number 1, the relationship. In verse 1, we saw the relationship relationship. David said, the Lord is my relationship, is my shepherd. He's talking about the shepherd relationship. We, we began that by realizing in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Psalms 22 is the, is the psalm about the good shepherd. Psalms 23 is about Jesus Christ, the great shepherd. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. We must understand as the good shepherd, he is a personal shepherd. He wants us to have a personal, loving, deep, thriving relationship with him. He says, my sheep know my voice and follow me. I wonder, have you heard the voice of the Lord this week and are you following him? I pray tonight you'll hear the voice of the Lord and follow him. You need to know his voice. You need to know when he's speaking to you. You need to be sensitive to the Lord speaking to your heart. When you open the word of God, you should be looking at not as a book. You should be looking at not as just a, just a requirement. You're looking to hear the voice of Jesus Christ speak to you. He is a shepherd who is personal. He's a shepherd who's plentiful. He says, uh, he says, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, I'm thankful as a shepherd, every day his goal is to take us into the green pastures. And I'm thankful every day he tries to take us to those, into those still waters. And I'm thankful that he takes us through valleys and up to the, the mountaintop there so we can get into that lush meadow and enjoy him. But he is a shepherd who gives abundantly. He gives plentifully. He's a shepherd who's good. He's a shepherd who's great. The Lord is my shepherd. David's recounting a year, many years of his life when he recognized that he is a sheep and God was his shepherd. Jesus was his shepherd. And then notice in this relationship he's personal. In this relationship he's plentiful. Plentiful, but in this relationship, he's powerful. He says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. How many glad tonight that once you're saved, you're always saved? Amen. How many glad tonight he that has the Son has life 
But he that has not the Son of God has not life. He's a powerful shepherd. There's that relationship in verse 1. But notice in verses 1 to 3, we see the repletion, the repletion. Now, the repletion means this. In verses 1 to 3, we see how the Lord abundantly satisfies our needs. He abundantly satisfies our needs. Look at verses 2 and 3. He feeds us. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Well, what, for what purpose? So that we can eat. He, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to eat. We need to be nourished. Hey, listen, you need to be on a steady, consistent, constant diet of the Word of God. Now, a joke around my house between my wife and I is because I, I have a high metabolism. I'm always hungry. And so it's kind of this, she kind of says, okay, here we go again. She says, aren't you ever full? And she'll look at me one hour after we eat something. We may have a bit, I may have a big meal, and uh, she has probably a small, moderate-sized meal. And, she, and I'll say something like this at 10 o'clock. Man, I'm hungry. I get something else to eat. And she says, you're always hungry there. Well, you know, God wants the spirit to be like, he wants us always hungry. Amen. You know, now I know physically it's probably not good to be always hungry, but you need to be hungry. If you're not, hey, listen, if you're not hungry, if you're, you're not eating, that's not a good sign. Amen. And you, you need to be hungry for the word of God. Uh, some, some of our folks get copies of the outlines that, that I prepare. I send it to them so they can kind of study and look at it. And I'm thankful one of our, one of our uh, wonderful families in church contacted me today or yesterday and they said, pastor, we just want to ask if we can get back on the list. and want to make sure we get copies of the outline because we enjoy studying them ourselves as we hear the preaching and we study through it. It just blesses our heart. You know, what they're really saying is just, you know, they're hungry for the Word of God. And we need to hunger. We need to be like the heart that panteth after the water brook. We need to be panting after God and desiring Jesus Christ. Listen, no Christian should ever be at the place they're tired of God. Amen? You should never be tired of church. You should never be tired of preaching. You should never be tired of the Word of God. You should never be tired of any of those things. Listen, there ought to just be a, a, a voracious appetite we have for the things of God. In, in this repletion, He feeds us. He makes me to lie down in green pasture. Now, sometimes we're like little kids. They're hungry, but they like to run around. How many experience that? Amen? Little kids, they may be hungry, they're, but they're always running around. They always get distracted, okay? So we have to sit them down to eat. Christians get like that too. We get too busy. We get too occupied. We get filled with junk food. You know what? The Lord has to make us to lie down. He has to bring us to green pastures to eat. He doesn't lead us into burned out brown, brown pastures there that really cannot take care of your soul. He leads us in green, lush pastures. He makes us to lie down. Listen, don't don't ever get tired of the preaching of God's Word. Don't ever get tired of Bible conferences and revival conferences. Don't get tired. Young people, don't get tired this summer. You'll be going to some camps and hearing preaching in those camps. You just need to take up as much as you can and enjoy the Word of God. And listen, we need to be in this place where we say, Jesus, take me to those green pastures and make me to lie down. I need you to feed my soul. Amen. Amen. He feeds us. Hey, listen, in this repletion, He leads us. Now listen, we need leadership in our life. I just found one thing. There are a lot of things in life where we need to be led. The Bible says this, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Why? Because sheep, in their own tendency, they'll step into waters that are dangerous. They'll step into waters that have fast current or undercurrents and they'll get pulled under. He leads us. He leads us beside the still pat waters. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Listen, if we're either, either the Lord is leading us or we're leading ourselves. Either the Lord is leading us or somebody else is leading you astray. Let me tell you tonight, if you're getting your information, your example off the internet and your example from social media, it's, it's, it, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. You young people tonight, I want to put this out here. You young people tonight, there's a lot of trends going out there. You young people tonight, even you adults might think, well, the trend is I need to get all tatted up because everybody's getting tatted up. Or I need to pierce my ears and pierce my face. Listen, you need to study your Bible and realize you don't put any markings on your body. Your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost. And you need to recognize tonight, you don't pierce your Body. And listen, parents, a good lesson time you give your, your children is to teach them that their bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. You don't pierce your body. You don't tattoo it. You say, well, pastor, everybody's doing it. Just because everybody does it doesn't mean you need to do that. We need to follow God's word. We have to understand these bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost there. I'm just saying to him, he leads us. You read the word of God and you read it with your eyes open. You realize he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name. Listen, God does not lead you in a path of lust. God does not lead you to the path of pornography. God does not lead you into the path of adultery. I mean, I get sick and tired of these people that get off, they get into a relationship with someone that's not their spouse or they have a, they're, in a, they're in an immoral relationship and they just, well, the Lord just led me there. The Lord didn't lead you there. You led yourself. Amen? I'm saying tonight, he leads us. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name. God, when God is leading you, he never leads you wrong. 
He never leads you wrong. But listen tonight, he leads us, he feeds us. Notice what he says here. He satisfies us. He says, I shall not want. He takes such good care of us, we are not lacking in anything. One of my, one of my favorite um, authors I like to read every now and then is, a, is a, a more contemporary pastor, but he has some great thoughts every now and then I, I, I like to read. Is a pastor by the name of Pastor Robert Morgan. And he said this, he wrote this out about the fact of the satisfaction of Jesus Christ. I'm gonna read it to you. He says, I shall not lack peace and provision life, for he makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me by still waters. I shall not lack hope and encouragement, for he restores my soul. I shall not lack guidance, for he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. I shall not lack deliverance from tough times, for even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I shall not lack companionship, for you are with me. By the way, if you're lonely in life right now, always remember, God is always with you. And he never leaves you. And he never forsakes you. That's a blessing. Amen. Uh, I shall never lack, uh, I shall not lack protection. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. I shall not lack help and healing in all the events in life. For you anoint my head with oil. I shall not lack endless blessings. For my cup overflows. I shall not lack anything. For goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I shall not lack an eternal heavenly home. For I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm saying tonight, there's the repletion. But notice thirdly, we see the relationship. We see the repletion. Notice verse 3, the restorer. He restoreth my soul. Brother and sister in Christ, I have to tell you, we will have times in our life where we are going to be on our back. The Bible calls it being cast down. We're going to be on our back. We're going to be in our back groveling. We're going to be on our back grumbling. We're going to be in our back grieving. We're going to be in some situation. We're on our back, and we can't get ourselves back up. But listen, the Lord picks us up and puts us right back on our feet. Amen? He restored my soul. I'm thankful for those hard times. I'm thankful for those difficult times. I'm thankful for those weak times. I'm thankful for those, those times when all I had was God, and I was groveling there in the sand, and I was grieving in my heart, and the Lord picked me up and set my feet on that solid rock. Amen? I mean, he set us up, and he gets us to the place where he gets us back on our feet. He restored my soul. Now listen, if you're somewhere in your Christian life right now where you're just like that psalmist where he says, I'm cast down, you feel depleted, You feel drained. You feel like you need something fresh in your life. Listen, I'm going to tell you this evening, that shepherd we have, Jesus Christ, can put you back on your feet even tonight. He restores my soul. He restores my soul in dark times. He restores my soul when somebody leaves my life. He restores my soul when things are tough. He picks me up like the sheep that went astray in Luke 15 and puts me on his shoulders. He picks me up and he, and he, puts, me, he puts me in places where we can thrive. He picks me up and returns to me the joy of my salvation. He restores to me the years that the palmer worm and the canker worm and the caterpillar have eaten away. He restores to us the strength and the service that have gotten depleted, that have gotten shriveled up like the man who had a shriveled hand. Listen, Whatever you are at, whatever's happening, whatever's shriveled up, whatever's been depleted, whatever's been drained, whatever you've lost, he can restore that and he can restore that even tonight for you this evening. We see the relationship. We see the repletion. We see the restorer, but notice we see the refining. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, That's trials, problems, hard times, sufferings, discouragement. In some cases, serious depression. But the valleys, the path our shepherd leads us on. You know, if we don't go down that valley, we won't understand or experience the grace of God. We are encouraged to grow in the grace of God and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The starting point for grace is when we get saved. But the sustaining point of grace is when we go through suffering. And he has to put us through these trials of afflictions to help us understand, and that's what the valley of the trial of death is all about. I want to tell you tonight, the valley of the trial of death is unavoidable and a necessary part of the journey. Uh, Without this valley, we won't learn what it means to trust in the Lord. Without that valley, we won't pray diligently. And I want to tell you tonight, uh, everyone walks through this valley. When everyone goes, by the way, nobody ever runs through the valley of the shadows. We always walk through that valley. It's a slow walk. It's a tedious walk. It's a fearful walk. 
It's a frightening walk. It's a worrying walk. It's an anxious walk, but it's a walk that we have to have. Notice some things he says there in verse 4. When we walk through that valley, he gives us his presence. For thou art with me. Thou art. And by the way, he's right at our side. He gives us his presence. We're in that valley. He gives us his patience. He says, uh, he says here, you know, you just have to follow me. You got to stay right with me. You got to follow me. He gives us his presence. He gives us his patience. He gives us his protection. He says, I will fear no evil. I mean, imagine that. We get to this place where we realize it doesn't matter what's around the corner. And it doesn't matter what I can't see. And it doesn't matter what I don't know. And it doesn't matter the shadows over me are darkened. Listen, he says this I will fear no evil. He says, There is evil, but I'm not going to be fearful. God just gets us a place where instead of having fear, he gives us courage and faith and confidence in him. He gives us his presence. He gives us his patience. He gives us his protection. He gives us his peace. He says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There's the refining in this, this journey we have with him. But notice something else here, and this gets us to very close to where we're going to be. In verse 1, we see the relationship. In verses 1 to 3, we see the repletion. In verse 3, we see the restorer. In verse 4, we find the refining. Notice in verse 5, we find the refreshing. Now, David, as we saw in our study, the, the shepherd has, is leading him through that valley. Now he's making his way. He's out of the shadow of that valley. And he knows the shepherd's leading him in the right path. And he's making his way upwards. And he, does, he now takes him to a big meadow, a meadow where it's flourishing with green grass, a meadow where there's fresh flowing water, a meadow where the, where the dew comes, comes, comes down every night, a meadow where there's sudden rains, and it's, it's, it's always abundant there, and we're, we're, we're taken care of. And he says this, and he, and he likens this, it's like sheep going there, and of course at that high elevation levels the predators are closer there are bears up there there are mountain lions up there there are things like that but he says this he says in verse 5 thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy he puts it this way that he prepares a king's banqueting table for us the Lord brings us to the table when we get saved and he brings us there and says you are an invited guest like Mephibosheth you can be there for all the days of your life there he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies he's saying it doesn't matter who the enemies are I'm going to take care of you I'm going to nourish your soul. I'm going, to, I'm going to take care of you. Your enemies are going to watch, and they're going to scratch your heads. They're going to wonder what's going on. Hey, listen, Job experienced that. Job went through some terrible times of life, but he experienced that God was taking care of him. He prepared a table before him in the presence of his enemies. Listen, Jeremiah experienced that. He anoints our head with oil. He gives us medicine uh, for our soul, and he gives us the oil for our ministry. He, uh, he takes such care, good care of us as we're on that high mountainous level there in that meadow area. He says uh, the experience we have is he feels like my cup is overflowing. I mean, that's, that's the sound of a Christian who is blessed. And the sound, the sound of a Christian who's saying, you know, things are really good in my life. My cup is overflowing. Listen, we need to recognize that if our cup isn't overflowing, it's not filled. We need to get it filled. We need to fill with the presence of the Lord and the blessings of God there. So we see all this and we recognize that God is for us and God is with us. Even during our most difficult times, God takes very good care of every one of his children. Now let's get to where we're at in verse 6. In verse 1, he speaks about the relationship. In verses 1 to 3, he speaks about the repletion. In verse 3, he speaks about the restorer. In verse 4, he speaks to us about the refining. In verse 5, he speaks about the refreshing. Notice verse 6. David testifies of the recognizable. And David, if you can imagine, is kind of like on a crescendo. He's saying, all right, I've told you about all the things the shepherd's done in my life. I've got a relationship. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me in this, by the still waters. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He restores my soul. He gets me back on my feet when I'm down. He leads me through the valley of shadow of death, and he's with me. He's with me all the way. He doesn't go ahead of me. He doesn't abandon me. He's with me. He's with me all the way. He anoints my head with oil. He says, I don't have to fear evil. He says, thou art with me. He says, he gives me comfort through his rod and staff. He says, listen, I, he's, uh, he's giving me refreshment. He, sets, he makes the table before me in the presence of my enemies. And he says, he says here that my head's anointed with oil. My cup runneth over. And he says here, but now, now I get to the conclusion. And it's how much you know something. Surely 
I've come to one conclusion. Surely I've come to this assessment. Surely I know something that, about God's work in my life that is true, that is guaranteed. Listen, there's not a lot of things guaranteed in life. Years ago, Benjamin Franklin said, the only two things that are guaranteed in life are death and taxes. Well, I want to add two more to that. There is a guarantee we have, and that guarantee is restricted and only available to those who know the good shepherd, who know him as his sheep, those who are saved, those who are part of his flock, those people like you and I who are saved there. And we, he says this, he says, my conclusion about the Christian life, my conclusion about living for Jesus, my conclusion about having a relationship with the shepherd is this, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. David's saying this, listen, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen God's seed begging bread. And he's saying this, he said, God is with me. He says, he's going to lead me. He's going to prepare a path for me. He says, I'm not concerned about the future. I'm not worried about what lies ahead. I'm not worried about the fact this life is going to have a terminal point. I'm not worried about the fact I'll have more serious illnesses. I'm not worried about the fact that, because you know what? He says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Christian, friend, the perspective we need to have tonight is this. No matter how bad the economy gets, no matter who gets into office, no matter if we wind up in anarchy, no matter if we have anti-gun laws, no matter if we go hyperinflation, no matter what happens in this economy, no matter what happens with the government, no matter what happens with health care, no matter what happens with Social Security, one thing is for sure. Goodness and mercy shall follow you and me all the days of our life. Amen. It's good. He's just saying life is good, amen? Life is really good because goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days. Pastor, I got laid off my job. The Bible says goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of life. Pastor, my, my, my spouse just passed away. That's hard, but goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of life. Pastor, I'm getting old. Goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of my life. Pastor, I, I, I have these uncertainties in my life, these, these feelings going on. I'm not sure about goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Pastor, I don't have a lot of friends. Goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. He's saying here, surely, certainly I know this. Goodness and mercy are are with me every day of my life there. Amen. Think about that for a minute. All the days of my life. Moses talked about the days of our life in Psalms 90. The average person is three score and ten years. By way of blessing, it could be four score or 80 years of age. But he learned one thing. We are temporal, but he is eternal. Our life is short. Our life is like a vapor. But I want to tell you tonight, he's teaching us some lessons about life. That's what he's talking about here. First of all, he's telling us life is a gift. Life is a gift from God. Now, it begins as an earthly gift. He makes us. You've got to read Psalms 139 again just to rejoice in how he's, he, he, you know, we're, we're conceived in this mother's womb and though our parts are imperfect and all that, God knows our parts. He knows everything about us. I mean, Psalms 139 is a wonderful psalm dealing with the, all the major attributes of God that he's all-knowing and all-powerful and all-seeing. He knows you and I. And, he's, and he talks about, you know, we're being fearfully, wonderfully made. But I'm going to tell you tonight, life is a gift. Earthly life is a gift. Eternal life is a gift. We ought to thank God every day for the gift of life. We ought to thank God every day for, for, our, for our health. We ought to thank God every day that heaven's our home and Amen. Jesus has prepared a place for us. We never should forget that, 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 uh, that life is a gift. We should get rid of, uh, get rid of our, from us, this, uh, out of ourselves, this entitlement thinking that God needs us. God doesn't need us. We need God. Right. We need God. We need God. We only have one life to live, and it's the life that God has given you. Life is a gift. But there's a second thing. David, as he's writing this, not trying to, telling us that life is a gift. He's telling us that life is all about God. Right. Amen. We don't build God around our lives. We build our lives around God. We build on top of God. Let me give you some thoughts that are very simple, but we need to remember tonight. First of all, we're to love God with all our heart, Amen. all our soul, Amen. and all our mind. That's as simple as that, amen? Right. Don't, don't tell God, Lord, we love you, and you don't love him with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Because before you tell God you love him, you better say, Lord, help search my heart. If there are any idols in my heart that are distracting me from loving you with all my heart, all my soul. And all my... Let me tell you tonight, 
And please don't take offense those of you watching my live stream. But I believe tonight, if you love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, you're, you're going to seek God's face every time God's, the house of God is open. I believe you're, gonna, you're not going to neglect the Bible. I believe you're not going to neglect your prayer time. I, don't, I believe you're not going to neglect being, be serving God and honoring the Lord. I, I, don't believe, I, I believe you won't neglect the opportunity of getting the gospel to someone. We must love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Life is about God. Secondly, Solomon, you have to read Ecclesiastes many times to appreciate where Solomon is coming from. But he summed up the whole matter in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. He said this, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. As we think about life being about God, it's about obedience. Amen. It's about he's giving us the boundaries and the commandments for our lives and living our life. Listen, some of you young people are going to be going off for college, and that's very exciting. And it doesn't matter if it's Bible college or secular college. If you don't make a decision that you're going to stay in the boundaries of God's word, you're going to go far from God. You're going to follow the pattern of the world. You're going to follow the pattern of those college students. You're going to follow everybody else. You need to follow God, amen? amen. You need to follow the Lord. Amen. Okay, thirdly, we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. And all these things, whatever those things are, shall be added. We need to seek first the kingdom of God and his right. That's why in every prayer we pray, we have to pray this, now, Lord, how does whatever you, or where I'm at, how does this need a situation? How is this seeking the kingdom of God and your righteousness there? Fourthly, we're to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, and not to be conformed to this world, to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. You know, we live in a day and time. I remember growing up as a, as a young Christian in the, early, in the 70s. Hardly, I, I can remember many, many times a guest preacher would come and would preach from Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's what I'm talking about there. Today, we preach on it, and young people just kind of, they're just, they, there's a lot of pushback. You can feel the pushback. It says, this is my body. It's not your body. It's his body. He bought it with a price. You're saved. Your body belongs to Jesus Christ. It doesn't belong to the world. It doesn't belong to a boyfriend. It doesn't belong to a girlfriend. It doesn't belong to the internet. It doesn't belong to tattoos. It doesn't belong to, to piercings. It belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen? So we, we need to understand some tonight that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Hey, listen, if you're a young person, even an adult, you're a new Christian, Older Christian, if you've never laid your life on the altar and given your bodies a living sacrifice, you're out of the will of God. The will of God begins when you offer your bodies a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they offered a burnt sacrifice every day, which symbolizes the dedication of the believer. Giving your bodies a living sacrifice is something that you do to, to, do to the Lord as representing that it's living and God can use your life for his glory. We're to present it before him holy and acceptable unto God and not to be conformed to this world. Fifthly, Paul said this. Paul said this about God. He, said, he summed it up. He was in prison. He was chained to two Roman guards. He said, for to me to live is Christ. Amen. He says, for me to live is all about Jesus. Amen. That, that's as simple as it gets, amen? For me to live is all about Jesus. Amen. Not all about who I work for. Not all about who, whose favor I get. Not all about all those. For me to live is about Jesus. Because if you, if you, you can't fit what you do into that phrase, you're not living. You're, what you're living for is not about Jesus. You're saying, for me to live is my company. For me to live is my career. For me to live is this situation. No, for me to live is Christ. Amen. Life needs to be about God. Right. You go to bed at night, you're thinking about God. Amen. You wake up in the morning, you think about God. Amen. Amen. You're going to work, you're thinking about God. I mean, whatever it may be. Hey, you come to church, I'm thinking about God. Amen. Amen. I'm not thinking about I have to come to church. I'm thinking about it's about Jesus. Amen. Right. Amen. Okay. It's about God. You go so when you knock on doors, it's about God. Right. You're praying, it's about God. Life is about God. Right. Amen. What would life be without God? Miserable. Right. Terrible. But notice something else. Life is a gift. Life is about God. Life has guarantees. The word surely is a good word. Absolutely. With certainty. Unquestionably. Undeniably. Or we say this, you can bank on it. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That means this. It doesn't skip a day. It doesn't skip for holidays. It doesn't take a day off. All the days of my life, goodness and mercy follow me, amen? amen. 
It may, okay, we're going to make some bad decisions along the way. How many understand what I mean by that? You're going to make some bad decisions, okay? And you're going to make some good decisions. But it doesn't change one thing. Goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life, okay? It's going to follow you. It's still, God is still good no matter what there. Goodness and mercy follows all the days of our life. Life will have its good days. Praise God. Life will have those tough days. Life will have bumps in the road. Life will have valleys and certainties, but one thing's for sure, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We have two absolutes here, goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. Someone said this, goodness and mercy are like two sheepdogs keeping the sheep inside the flock. You ever watch sheepdogs? They're interesting. They just run around. They try to keep the sheep from going astray. They keep on barking. And so one goes on one side, is barking. And the sheep are going off this way, and they get them back into the fold. The other one's coming the other side, is barking away, gets them back in the fold. They keep on running around. I mean, sheepdogs have incredible energy, incredible resilience. They just love barking, keeping the sheep going. They know that's their ministry, is to keep sheep in the way. And goodness and mercy remind us today, every single day, God is with us. Goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. God doesn't take his eyes off us. God doesn't take his hand off us. God doesn't move his presence from us. Goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our life. Now, I can't guarantee you a lot of things. I can't guarantee you who's going to be the next president. I can't guarantee you what's going to happen in Congress. I can't guarantee you all the things like that. Nobody can guarantee that. I can't guarantee you what kind of economy we're going to have. I can't guarantee you when this, this, this crazy war with Russia and Ukraine is going to end. I can't guarantee you when the gas prices are going to come down. I can't guarantee you when inflation is going to stop. I can't guarantee you that you're going to have a healthy body for the rest of your life. But I can guarantee you this, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Amen. That I can guarantee you. Goodness. Goodness refers to everything that is moral and spiritual good. Listen to this. Goodness is God. Amen? Goodness is God. Listen, listen to what God himself said in Psalms 34, verse 6. He said, And the Lord passed by before him, and the Lord himself proclaimed, The Lord... The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and listen to this, and abundant in goodness and truth. Not just goodness, abundant in goodness and truth, amen? I mean, he's abundant in his goodness towards us. I mean, if, you're, if you've got your head hanging low and you're saying, oh, woe is me, better, you better memorize Psalm 30, Exodus 34, 6. He abounds in goodness and truth, the Bible says there. Now listen to this, Psalms 31, 9. Oh, how great is thy goodness, David said, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. God is great in his goodness, but the conditions of the greatness there is, is when we trust in him and when we fear him. Now, I'm going to tell you tonight, we need to be careful that we don't get so, so caught up with the things of this life. We're not trusting God. I have to trust God more today than I've ever had to trust him before. I have to fear God more today than I've ever feared him before. Right. Oh, how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up. Hey, did you say that at any time in the last 30 days? How great is thy goodness? Amen. He's good, amen? Right. God is good to us all the time, and all the time God is good. Hey, listen to this, Psalm 52, 1. Why boastest thou thyself in mischief, almighty man? David's talking about, talking about the, the man that betrayed him there. He says, oh, how, he says, why boastest thou thyself in mischief, O thou mighty man? He says, listen, you talk all this trash talk. You're talking all this junk stuff. He says, listen, the goodness of God endureth continually. He says, you, you can say all you want about me, but he says the goodness of God continue, con, endureth continually. Hey, you know what? No matter what happens, God is always good. Right. Goodness and mercy falls all the days of our life. What about Moses? God said he couldn't go into the promised land. Hey, goodness and mercy fall him all the days of his life. Guess who did his funeral and buried him? God did. They still can't find his body. You don't need to find his body. He's in heaven with the Lord. Amen? You know, you need to look for his body there. Hey, listen to this, Psalm 107, verse 8. Oh, that man would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that men would praise God, the Lord, for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. You've got to read Psalms 107, 8, the re re repetitious times this is brought up. Hey, listen, all things work together for good to them that love God. To him who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good, okay? That doesn't mean all things are, that may, may feel good to you, but all things work together for good. There's always good that comes out of that there. We have to understand, goodness and mercy follows all the days of our life. We have God's goodness whether we're rich or whether we're poor. We have God's goodness whether we're healthy or whether we're sick. We have God's goodness whether in good times or bad times. Goodness follows us all the days of our life. Hey, listen, Joseph, look at Joseph's life. His brothers betrayed him. He got falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. You know, he got forgotten in prison. 
he had, he had a few years that were pretty tough. I don't want to say they were miserable, but they were pretty tough. But he came to the conclusion later on after his father passed away, his brothers thought they were, that he was going to he was going to throw them all into prison. He said, you guys meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What a perspective on things. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good there. And listen, we'll have setbacks, but goodness will follow us all the days of our life. And we're going to have sickness, but goodness will follow us all the days of our life. We're going to have suffering, but goodness follows us all the days of our life. We're going to have suffering, but goodness will follow us all the days of our life. Hey, listen, we're going to have severance. Sometimes someone's going to cut you off. They're going to cut off that relationship. They're going to turn their back and they're going to leave you. They're going to leave the church. But listen, goodness still follows us all the days of our life. Amen. And by the way, let me say this. The goodness of God leadeth to repentance. Amen. The goodness of God leads a sinner to be saved. So you deal with a tough, stubborn sinner, just, just stop them from it. Hey, hey, listen, just ask them, has life been good? And if they say no, that, that's a very miserable person. They, they have to come to the conclusion that all the goodness in their life came from God. Listen, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above. From the Father of light, to whom there's no variables, neither shadow. Hey, listen, goodness falls all the days. Aren't you glad that the good thing is that Jesus came to earth and died for our sins and shed his blood for us? Aren't you glad for the good thing Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above. Hey, I remind you, there's goodness. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. Hey, listen, goodness follows us. Mercy follows us. Mercy is God's compassionate love and pity towards you and I. The older I get, the more I'm very thankful for his mercies. The older I get, I'm reminded, man, without God's mercies, I, I, I won't make it. The Bible says this, his mercies are new every morning. Amen. You get a fresh start every day, amen? amen? A fresh start, a fresh infusion, fresh outpouring of his mercies every morning. Amen. Hey, did you experience it today? Amen, you know? Amen. His mercy is new every morning. Hey, without his mercy, we are consumed. Right. We're consumed in his wrath. Right. Without his mercies, judgment's been passed on us. Without his mercies, listen, our sins aren't expunged. Without his mercies, there's no justification. Without his mercies, there's no redemption. Without his mercies, there's no forgiveness. Without his mercies, there's the judgment of God upon every one of us there. Without his mercy, there'd be no salvation. Genesis 39, 21, listen to this. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Can you imagine where Joseph was at? How low he felt that moment? He was falsely accused of sexual harassment. <laughs> that woman lied about him. And Potiphar got so angry, he believed his wife. He threw him into prison. And Joseph thought, man, my, my life is going in a, in a cycle, man. He just, I, my, my, my brothers threw me in a pit. They sold me to the Ishmaelites. I'm here in Egypt. I've tried to work my way back out, and here I am again. I didn't do anything wrong. He could have got bitter with God. I mean, you, you look at the situation, you take God out of the picture, the average unsaved person or the carnal Christian would say, that's all God's fault. He, no, the Bible says here in, in Genesis 39, 21, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. Now, I'm not sure how that mercy went, but I believe he visited him there in that prison. He says, Joseph, I love you. It's just like Paul when he was on that ship there in, in Acts 27, and the Bible says the sun and the moon and stars were gone for days, and all hope that we should be saved was lost. Even, even, even Paul was just felt things were a little bit hopeless that time, and he started thinking about, I better get ready here. The Lord, the Lord may want me to go home, and this is probably, my grave's going to be here in the water there. And the Bible says the angel Lord stood by him that night, and he experienced the goodness of God in that night. The Lord showed him mercy. When everything was going around, there was darkness, and there was storm, and there was rain, and they were drenched, and everyone was discouraged and going their different ways, God came on to Moses, came on to Paul at that wonderful time there. I want to say, tell you this tonight. God's mercy endures forever. Amen. It endures the storms. It endures, it endures political climate changes. It endures changes in law. It endures dictatorships. It doesn't matter. It's always available. It never runs out. It could never be depleted. Listen to this, Psalms 86, 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Listen, mercy follows us all the days of our life. Uh, Psalms 94, 18. Here's what the psalmist said. Asaph said this. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Praise God for that. 
when your foot's slipping, his mercy holds us up. Second right. Corinthians 4.1. Remember our series, 2 Corinthians, one of the big challenges Paul had? False teachers, false apostles came in. They discredited Paul. And they duped the Corinthians into saying, he doesn't have the credentials, he doesn't have the authenticity, he's not an apostle. In fact, you know, if you want to let him come back, you shouldn't let him come back. But if you do, go get letters of reference from other people and check out those letters of reference. Paul said, wait, I don't need letters of reference. You're, the letter of my commendation is what's done in your heart. It's inside your heart. You got saved through my ministry there. He said, well, I don't need that kind of stuff there. But here's what Paul said. In spite of all of that, those setbacks there, he said this in 2 Corinthians 4, one. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, we faint not. Hey, listen, mercy, when you rest on the mercy of God, it keeps you from, it keeps you from fizzling out. It keeps you from quitting. It keeps you from throwing in the towel. It keeps you from getting mentally and spiritually exhausted. It, gets, it keeps you from quitting. It keeps you from leaving church. It keeps you from leaving your service. Listen, most people leave what they do that's right because they're not leaning upon the mercies of God. You've gotten self-centered when you should be Christ-centered. Thy mercies are new every morning. My foot slippeth, yet thy mercies help me up. Then Ephesians 2, 4, but God. Yeah, I'm a sinner. That's what verses 1 and 3 says. Yeah, I'm a child of the devil. Yeah, I'm depraved. Yes, I am a child of darkness. Yes, I'm a child in deserving damnation. But God, amen. Amen. If it wasn't for God, God who is rich in mercy, maybe you get it tonight? Mercy is plenteous. Mercy holds us up. Mercy is rich. Mercy is abundant. Listen, God shows his mercy. God doesn't withhold mercy. We need to plead for mercy. That's why we're told in Philippians, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy right. and find grace to help Amen. in time of need. Amen. God, he's rich in his mercy. Right. Mercy follows us all the days of our life. God remembers we are dust. He gives us mercy. Amen. Sinners are saved because of God's mercy. Amen. We are kept safe because of his mercy. Amen. But remember this. Remember this. Goodness and mercy are hand in hand. They're inseparable. They're unbelievable twins. Goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. Amen. Not one and not the other, but both. Goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. That's a guarantee. Job experienced goodness and mercy all the days of his life, and he had a tough life. If you were Job, you lost your (laughs) you lost your houses, lost your livestock, you lost your children, lost your health, you want, your wife is bitter with God, and then your three friends are accusing you of living in sin and saying this, this is all because of sin. I mean, just, he had it tough. But he recognized goodness and mercy for him all the days of his life. Hey, Jeremiah recognized it. He had goodness and mercy all the days of his life. And Jeremiah had to preach a tough message. He got thrown into prison. He got slapped around. I mean, he had all these terrible things as we get through the book of Jeremiah that happened to him. But goodness and mercy followed him all the days of his life. Hey, Paul had the same thing. I mean, you read 2 Corinthians 11, all the things Paul went through, he, but he could testify. Goodness and mercy followed us Followed him all the days of his life. Hey, Charles Weigel, who wrote the song, No One Ever Cared for Me Like Jesus, Amen. he wrote that song out of the realization, goodness and mercy follows us Amen. all the days of our life. Amen. How are you going to make it through the Christian life? You need to recognize and accept the doctrine that goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. Amen. Are you struggling because of a trial or hardship? Goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. Amen. Are you greatly discouraged in your family, your job, or something going on that's out of your control, goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. Right. It's a certainty. Right. It's a guarantee. Amen. David's saying this, it's great. Amen. Life is great, amen? Right. He saying it's wonderful to be a Christian. Amen. It is. Amen. Because goodness and mercy right. follows us all the days right. of our life. Right. Life's not easy, but goodness and mercy follows us all the days of our right. life. You're going to get to the place, you're going to hate your job. 
but goodness and mercy is going to follow you all the days of your life, okay? You're going to get the place in life. You're going to hate the chase in life, okay? And, but goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. You're going to get the place in realizing, you know, I've been young and now I'm old, but goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. You're going to have days where your children will frustrate you and you're going to say, you're going to wonder what's going on, but goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. Hey, listen, you're watching my live stream tonight. It's not by an accident you're watching my live stream. If you're far from God, I'm going to tell you, goodness and mercy follows you all the days of your life. He's with you there. The goodness of God leadeth to repentance. You know what I think we need to do tonight? We need to have an old-fashioned time of thanking God for his goodness and mercy in our life. Amen. During our invitation time, we need to thank him that goodness and mercy is with us all the days of our life. Amen. There's a lot of things I can't promise you about the days of your life, but I can tell you this. Goodness and mercy, according to the word of God, will follow you all the days of your life. You need to thank God for that tonight. Amen. And you need to commit your troubles and your problems, your struggles, your burdens, your cares, your anxieties, your money troubles, your family troubles, your marriage troubles, your children troubles, whatever it may be, your job troubles, whatever it may be, whatever it is, just commit it to the Lord tonight and say, Lord, goodness and mercy, you said, will follow me all the days of my life. Would you trust him tonight? Would you let him give you an outpouring of his goodness and mercy? Would you just be sensitive to the goodness and mercy of God working your life? The goodness of God, the goodness of God.